Anderson, uh, welcome to all of you. It's so exciting to be starting our first virtual summer research seminar. Um, this is a new experiment for us. Um, even before the COVID situation started, uh, we had had discussions about um, maybe moving every other year to having a virtual summer research center and then this crazy coronavirus gave us the opportunity to really make it happen. Um, and just looking at you all out there, what a lovely start. It's so, so uh, heartwarming uh, to see you all here. Um, we may, as we learn about this together, have to stop and take a few deep breaths and let the spirit uh, uh, bring us into the moments as they present themselves. Um, but I'm sure that we uh, know how to deal with those kinds of challenges if they arise. Um, I uh, will, after turning this over for a few other people to say some welcoming remarks, do a quick review of, of, of the week. Um, and go over some last minute updates. And then we will start with our first uh, seminar presentation by Erica Adams. So before we get to that, um, let me turn it over to Gray, the clerk of uh, Quaker, Institute, uh, Quaker Institute for the Future, uh, to say a few welcome remarks. Um, it's great to see old friends and new. I'm, I'm uh, reminded of that uh, camp song Make new friends and keep the old. One is silver and the other's gold. Somehow, uh, this I think this summer will be a little bit like a camp experience for us all, learning new ways to be campers <laughs> together in a great journey towards the light. Um, as you all know, the 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 part of the key part of the tradition of the Quaker Institute for the Future is to try and be thinking about big issues and small issues that have to do with um, the prospering of truth in our world, in the economy and ecology and so on. And uh, our intent is to function not just as a, as a think tank in a traditional way, but to further do it uh, in, in a spirit-led way and to experiment with that. And uh, this summer, summer research seminar is gonna be another opportunity to experiment. We've in the past tried out all sorts of ways of taking the basic core Quaker process for governance, you know, we're meeting for worship for the conduct of business and seeking guidance out of the silence, out of the light. We've been experimenting with that for 15 years or so in um, using committee, clearness committees and Quaker worship and a variety of other things to, to uh, make them an integral part of, of the research. And um, I would encourage each of you as we go along this week, if you think of ways to try and help this particular process be more spiritually centered, um, be deepened in some way, uh, maybe deepen connections between people in parallel ways and side meetings or the like, uh, or using music or imagery. But however you, you think that we might try that, to, to please um, talk with organizers and, or present things directly to the group in breakout sessions or other times. Um, so that we can try and make this as successful an experiment as possible. Um, uh, for myself, I tend to get excited about these kinds of things and need to slow down. And it's, for me, part of trying to develop a kind of slow Zoom movement where we can have the intimacy that Zoom allows without the frenetic Google, Google Facebook, Facebook, face, Facebook mind that sometimes <laughs> connecting to the internet Pause. So trying to have a kind of slow zoom movement, zooming towards the light, but in a centered way. And for me, it helps to sing. I thought I would just share a brief song. Is that okay, Jeff and Shelly? A one minute song to help us, help me center down anyway, maybe of use to others. It, it, I don't think it would be right if we didn't have that song, Craig, oh, so right. please. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> so here it goes. Oh, oh. Oh, I'm gonna, gonna, gonna slow right down, yes. So I can get there 
get there sooner. I'm gonna, gonna, gonna slow right down. Yes. So I can, can get there today. Yeah. I'm gonna, gonna slow Maybe even come to a full stop. Oh, maybe if I come to a full stop, I'm gonna, gonna get there, get there right away. Yes. Thank you, friends, for joining us. And hope we're all already on the way there and we'll be there this whole week together. Well, Shelly, I'm going to let you follow up that act. So <laughs> if you have maybe just a few words, I know you helped plan this one. And also, um, more importantly, maybe you have played such a central role over the last few years for our summer research center uh, seminars. So. I just wanted to give you the chance to say some welcoming words. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we always create some magic in these seminars, and I can't completely explain what happens, but um, especially if you stick with this every day, you, you develop a, a rapport and a sense of community with the group, some of whom you may have, you know, maybe for some of you, you may have never met any of us before, and here, here we are. But by the end of the week, um, there, there's just something magical that happens um, if you open yourself up to it. And I'm uh, greatly appreciative of everyone who has brought some kind of project, uh, research, um, some passion that you've been working on sometimes for years, and you're willing to share it with us and we'll see where spirit takes us in um, working with you to move you along on your path. Um, and um, there's a mixture of uh, some of us from the board here and some of us are gonna be helping with clerking and with the tech. So you'll see different faces in these roles and we've never done this on Zoom before. So we're learning along with you. So. Um, appreciate your patience with whatever comes up. Great to see you all. We've set this up at, at least for the uh, first and last sessions each day to have a clerk. So I'll be clerking this first uh, session and also someone who's going to be our Zoom helper or whatever we would call that person. So that's going to be Shelly right now. So I'm going to make Shelly a co-host. So she has all kinds of powers now. Um, there you go, Shelly. Uh, if you have any concerns with Zoom, um, the thing to do uh, is you can use the chat function. Um, that should be on my uh, computer. It's at the bottom of the screen. There's a number of things like stop video, security participants, chat. Um, you can either uh, when you hit chat, you can send a message to all of us, that's everyone, or just to one person. And so if you need technical help, Shelly would be for this session, uh, the person to turn to. And we'll let you know at the beginning of each session who is the Zoom helper. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the, my screen again and just do a little walkthrough of the week as we get started here, um, provide a few updates and then we'll settle into silence and uh, start with our first uh, presentation. So I'm going to share my screen. Can you all see that? Thumbs up or something? Great. So here is what the week looks like. And as I think you've probably gathered, we will start every day 
with, let's see. We'll start every day with one or two presentations as listed and short descriptions of all those pres presentations are in the, the program. And then uh, from 4.30 to 6, uh, East Coast time, 1.30 to 3. Uh, oh, well, well, let me, let me uh, correct this. This is the first important update. Um, the first session every day will be going from noon to 3 p.m. Eastern time, not 3.30. Uh, those times did not match with Eastern time and Pacific time. So please take note that those first sessions will go three hours, not three and a half hours. Um, the second part of each day will be these breakout rooms. And this is our effort to create some space for everybody to get together in a more informal way in between our, our, our worship sessions um, in, in however you wish to get together. Um, now, I had an idea for one of those today. I'm going to be the host of the breakout rooms. We'll have different hosts on different days. We need hosts because only the host under Zoom can assign you uh, to a breakout room. So each of those sessions will start with us signing in pretty promptly. Um, we maybe give people up to 10 minutes uh, to gather and we'll have a discussion on what kind of breakout rooms we might want to have. So um, I can create uh, one or two breakout rooms. If it's only one, we'll just stay in the plenary. Um, and if it's two, then, um, then you'll let me know which one you'd like to be assigned to and I'll assign you to it. Um, I thought today one of those could be, for those of you who are still getting used to Zoom and want to have a little working session so that you're more comfortable with it, we could do that. I'd be happy to lead um, something like that. And if anyone wants to help me lead that, you could let me know by chat or somehow. Um, some of you who have a lot of experience with that. Uh, just what do all the buttons mean? How do I share my screen if I haven't done that? How do I chat? How do I make it so I can see everybody? How could I make it so I can see only the person who's speaking? Um, and so on. I've sent you some links on, on doing that, but sometimes it helps to have a little working session. Um, but if you have other ideas for a breakout room uh, activity today, um, you know, maybe something that Gray said about how we can uh, build community, that would be another thing to, to have a breakout room discussion about. Um, how can we create the kind of community that Shelly mentioned that, typically builds during the course of a summer research seminar week. Um, but please do, uh, if, you, if you can manage, uh, tune in for, 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 for the breakout rooms and, and uh, for, for, for whatever informal discussion you wanna have. And then the evening, uh, we've decided to go with theme-based uh, discussions and we'll have one person each evening give a bit of a, a, a focused reflection on the topic and then we'll also be able to share out of worship on, on, on that theme. And you'll see in the program, several of the themes uh, have, there have been um, some, uh, uh, some, some thought provoking uh, papers shared. So please do look at those papers and take note of which discussion they pertain to and make an effort to uh, familiarize yourself with that reading um, in advance of the discussion. None of them are very long. All of them are quite thoughtful. So I hope you find those to be a good resource. Um, the last slide I have for you, I decided to create what I'm calling the Summer Research Seminar Bulletin Board. Um, I've just sent you all an email with this link. Um, so I've started the document there. And this is really just an open forum for you to share any, any ideas you have regarding issues that come up. So maybe afterthoughts that, that come to you after a discussion, um, links to related resources, uh, perhaps creative offerings, um, uh, whatever you're inspired to share through that other 
um, a venue for being together this week. Um, I'm going to stop now. And the last thing I want to mention before we settle into silence and to take any questions or concerns you have uh, is about the protocol we have for recording the sessions. So some of you, uh, for example, I will probably do this. Um, Erica has asked that we do this this morning, might want your presentation to be recorded and then you can use that in various ways. We can make that available to you as a, as a video file and you can then share that uh, in your own networks however you wish. Um, it also, I think for, uh, for QIF, we may, through our own social media, take little excerpts here and there um, and use them just to, to show people what we do. Um, so if you have any concerns about appearing in any of those videos, uh, please share that with, with me um, so we can make a note uh, to make sure that you're not included in any uh, video or material that might go on, on social media or something like that. You can send me an email or put that in the bulletin board, however you wish to, to communicate that. And I just want to make sure you have that opportunity. But to be clear, we'll do this on an opt out basis. If we don't hear from you, then we're going to assume that you don't have a problem with that. Um, yeah, so why don't we all settle into silence. Um, and, uh, and Erica, when you're ready, please proceed. Okay. Well, <laughs> to the end the suspense, <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me or having me and um, um, I made this as a kind of follow-up for the uh, talks I gave at sessions the last two years and at Quaker Institute for the Future uh, this past um, 2019 it was in, in West Falmouth Quaker meeting where I'm from. Can everyone hear me? Okay well that that's good. Am I loud enough? All right, <laughs> all right, all right. Um, so uh, I've been working, um, um, and I'm very pleased to have two people here in particular. Um, one, Carlotta Duarte, who's in Chiapas, Mexico, and uh, here on Zoom. And she started the Chiapas Photography Project um, about 1992 to give the tools of photography to the Maya there uh, to do whatever they wanted to. And they have about 12 books and a couple of traveling shows. And they've been all over the world. And so it's a very important project. And I met her in 1990. And uh, before she started the project, we both lived in Cambridge. She's a sister of the Society of the Sacred Heart. And um, uh, Larry uh, also, uh, Larry um, Jordan helped me get the first legacy grant uh, to basically show this show, which is about Maya religious diversity and coexistence after decades of strife in Chiapas, Mexico. It's called Respeto or Respect for the Religious Practices and, and, and uh, Belief Systems. And I co-curated that with Carlotta, or we were curatorial assistants to the very organized Maya. And so today I'm talking about peace in terms of conflict times of conflict, excuse me. And it's in three sections, uh, quarantine, riots, and monuments, something I think we've all been watching on screen. And I decided to do something in a more personal way, um, along with facts, because having grown up with my father, who was a think tank person, uh, all branches of government, he did public policy. Uh, the facts and statistics I know can be bent in any direction, so. I, I imagine that I'm just as, um, how to say, personalized as anybody else of my own belief system. Okay, so let's see, how do I get this to go? Um, peace, uh, it's a question, um, how much peace is, we're talking about the United States as we haven't really had. Uh, 
and I looked at all the major wars, uh, all this easily available information, <laughs> and then the American Indian Wars. I honestly, with eight point type, did not have enough space to put it on one page. But these are the majority of what was listed. Um, and so you see the American Civil War, the Revolutionary War, and I, I put in the Civil Rights Movement and what I called the George Floyd Rebellion. Uh, the last Indian uprising was about 1923, and it started 1776, the Cherokee American Wars. So uh, I think that goes without saying. And then I was thinking about uh, Boston, where basically I grew up in Boston and I moved to the Cape uh, 20 years ago uh, and continued to commute to Boston to teach at uh, the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, which was the art school that's part of Tufts University. And on 9-11, I was starting my first class um, and everything was evacuated by 11 o'clock. The uh, terrorists flew out of Logan Airport, which maybe if you don't live here, you've forgotten that. And uh, so the atmosphere was very particular. There was no traffic at 8.30 in the morning in downtown Boston when I drove to the museum school in the Fenway district of, of Boston near all the hospitals. And um, when I drove home late at night, there wasn't a single car on the highway for 70 miles. And then when I got to the bridge to cross Cape Cod, I could see the bottom of the canal. And I got home and there was a, a girl wrapped in an American flag and she had been one of two people in a helicopter, don't ask me what kind, I don't know this, that flew out of Otis Air Force Base. And uh, they had hoped to, um, how to say, shoot the airplane that was going into the second tower. And to give you an idea, they missed by one or two minutes and it took them seven minutes to fly from, it wasn't a helicopter, fly from uh, Cape Cod to New York City. It's faster than we go. So, and then I came back from um, Mexico where, and then Italy uh, on my sabbatical where I'd been doing different projects. Um, and there was a Boston Marathon uh, bombing about two weeks after I got home. And everybody I know, including myself, has stories about their proximity to this or that. Um, and where it ended up, they found one of the terrorists in a boat and it was in Watertown in the shared driveway um, that belonged to my friend's house. Um, so there were no degrees of separation really. Uh, very traumatizing also um, when I got out of grad school in the late 80s, I worked at Cambridge Ridge in Latin, which is a public high school, and they teach everything in nine different languages. Um, anything you might imagine, they teach chemistry and Cantonese and Vietnamese and so on. So it was very, we could say, multicultural. And um, I know teachers who had the two bombers in their classes and, um, you know, they had the best of everything and they had Cambridge for whatever that means. And they, um, ended up really hating this country as immigrants. Well, and then of course we have the Portland uh, masked men, I love this, masked men clad indistinguishably from soldiers, yanking civilians off the street in the dead of night and throwing them into unmarked cars is the modus operandi of totalitarian regimes or the stuff of dystopian fiction. I think, you know, we're all on screens right now and some of us are in the street that this is the most frightening thing that I've seen in my entire life. So quarantine, who expected quarantine? I wish in a way that we could do breakouts in between each section, but I don't think this is gonna happen. So I came back from Boston and I put myself in quarantine when Harvard University closed down Sanders Theater, uh, where I hear all kinds of wonderful concerts. Um, and I've been going there for 50 years. And when I understood that the students weren't coming back, that they were going to go online, I knew that something was terribly up, uh, up and uh, frightening. So in Massachusetts in particular, the first case was February 1st. I myself was sick, but test proved I wasn't sick with COVID, but it was something else. 
And uh, it was a very rapid increase. And I think that's what we're all uh, worried about is how quickly this spreads. And March 10th, uh, the Governor Baker declared a state of emergency and I'd already been in quarantine two days. And so this all happened really quickly. And uh, March 12th, 100 people had tested positive and no one was being tested. Mid-March, systematic testing began and I had friends who did that. It was really amazing in Cambridge in particular. And then March 15th, all the schools were closed, restaurants, gatherings of more than 25. And then the CARES Act relaxed some unemployment claims for uh, um, receiving benefits. March 23rd was a stay at home uh, advisory and it closed all non-essential businesses, including construction. March 22nd, 7th, they extended the tax deadline and remote learning happened in Harvard, MIT, Tufts and BU and many other colleges. And then on the 30th, 43,000 tests were done uh, by Quest Diagnostics. Uh, Boston Mayor Wild uh, Walsh announced April 2nd that there were field house hospitals. Tufts University set up dormitories, for example, as a possible field hospital. It, I don't think it was needed. A curfew was given April 5th and masks in public were mandatory. And then um, uh, MIT did a preliminary stud study, I thought this is interesting, of sewage, about uh, 1,000, 115,000 um, regions were, uh, 2.3 million were infected and they only had 646 confirmed cases in the area. April 28th to May 28th was an extended stay at home. And whoops, wait a minute, the surge was over, typically 22nd to 31st. Um, and then phase two happened when childcare, day camps, retail stores, outings could open. Um, and in June 22nd, we had the lowest, Massachusetts, the lowest transmission in the country. Um, and July 2nd, phase three was including gyms, casinos, and museums, which have been suspended. They're no longer opened. Uh, 29th of July, uh, COVID-19 deaths were uh, 7,243 of 8,580. 84% are 70 and older. So what does this mean? Um, I think it, uh, it bears saying again that it exposed the fault lines. The, uh, the income inequality, who could stay home and work, who had to depend on uh, CARES Act, which was for part-time workers, uh, who had to go to work, um, and it exposed the systemic racism with African Americans dying at a higher rate than their percentage of the population. It exposed sexism, who had to go to work and how, and classism, who had money to get by as if it was an extended vacation. Medical insurance crisis, it was probably the best case we could have since the depression that we should have a unified um, national health care. <clears throat> Housing crisis was exposed. As of uh, July 30th, um, the insurance of the $600 a month is being reduced. And they're again playing with the elderly, the disabled, and the poor, um, deciding how much they'll be getting. And people who didn't have to pay their rent for the first three months of the quarantine are now many facing evictions and mortgages are going uh, unpaid. And then food insecurity. There are more people. I saw lines in the beginning of cars out west for middle-class people trying to get food. Okay, so the unemployment rate in Massachusetts in March was 2.9. Boston in particular, had the most, um, how to say, the, one of the strongest, eight strongest uh, uh, com um, economies in the United States. So good, you saw buildings going up everywhere, cranes were everywhere. It was flush, like uh, Silicon Valley was flush. And if you were here in Boston, you couldn't know how badly things were already in the rest of the country. And so that was 2.9% versus 4.4% of the rest of the United States. And by June, it was 17.4%. The Rake Depression was 25.6%. And then I opened the New York Times, which I read every day, the paper version. And on Friday, July 31st, it says virus wipes out five years of economic growth. So Wilson is working from home. <laughs> and um, we did Zoom 
almost immediately, we started mid-March at West Falmouth uh, meeting, and these are some of the people in the meeting, and also for the apology letter, the New England Yearly Meeting apology letter to Native Americans, we were working on Zoom. You can see uh, Leslie Manning here, and she's now presenting this at sessions, and then myself. And so the CARES Act was huge. I mean, it allowed a lot of people to survive. And again, the $600 a week uh, will uh, stop uh, being paid on July 31st until something is added. And this allowed people to pay their bills and the economy to thrive in a way that it won't without that money. And so everybody had to do information gathering simply because no one really knew. The medical community, as strong as it is in Boston, with all the teaching hospitals, um, nobody really knew anything about COVID. And uh, so everyone was learning on the job. And it was very important for everybody, I think, I did, to look uh, at, at all the sources you could get and read. I must have read 10 articles a day. I turned on American news. And then uh, I started to wonder, OK, <laughs> where's the leadership now? I mean, this is an ongoing issue, right? And so Dr. Fauci had to speak between the lines. I think most of us could read it. And Nancy Pelosi got the CARES Act uh, passed, which was amazing. And then we had Donald Trump, who was in denial. I mean, I, this, I mean, a friend of mine said he was a mass murderer, and I thought this is a bit extreme. That was in the beginning of April. I don't think that now. I think uh, his policies have killed many, many people. So I started wondering, do I trust these people to let my news? How counterproductive is it to have to deconstruct everything that the president says and how he squelches Fauci? So I started uh, looking in other places and on my phone, I got inspiration from listening to the very militaristic approach of no nonsense New York Governor Andrew Cuomo who would tell you what was going on. And you know, a, a little of that for me was a, a, a nice morning dose, as good as the espresso that I have, the triple espresso that sort of gets me going. And then I thought Angela Merkel was like a breath of fresh air. And um, then she got uh, diagnosed with coronavirus. And uh, Justin Trudeau, this is his most recent look, is very easy to look at. And he's got great policy. So I listened to his podcast or his conferences um, when they came across. Recently, he's extended the very generous benefits for the Canadian citizens to also include the fact that they can go to work and earn money and keep their benefits if they want to. Uh, I go to Montreal for the last 40 years, two or three times a year. I have friends there and I'm very impressed by how the Canadians are handling things. Um, so I started listening to BBC. I don't know what everybody else has done, but that's what I could do because they had a broader view and I could hear, hear just as much about um, what was going on with Trump. So March 31st, we're like, what, three weeks into the whole session of, of, of um, quarantine and uh, our deaths have surpassed 9-11. Uh, it's a kind of achievement. And the quarantine's effects, I started to wonder about them, physical, psychological, metaphysical, spiritual. And I'm very interested um, in hearing other people's responses to how they experienced uh, the quarantine. And we had lots of graphs, you know, high risk, moderate risk, low risk, opening the mail is a low risk, going to a bar is a high risk, you know, I mean, it's nice to have these graphs because there was so much unknown and there was so much underlying anxiety that was going on. Um, and the psychological effects, I mean, were, did you have a spouse? Did you have children or grandchildren living with you? Um, were you like me just living at home with your orchids and no cat and no dog? Uh, what, was, what was your situation? As an artist who uh, taught at a university and prepared my classes at home, uh, working at home is a no-brainer, but I found it difficult to, to focus. I could focus on small articles in the New York Times, for example, or listen to news reports in BBC, and that was it. So some of the things that I started to do, um, 
was the Chappas Photography Project. I'm a US coordinator um, and I'm the only one really here. So I circulate the traveling shows and, and uh, the books when people buy them and arrange other things. So this is the new uh, book that just came out. It was a 15 year project um, by Refugia Guzman Perez and it was just published. And so I got a, a local uh, um, uh, dean of the college to write a review on it. Um, we're still trying to circulate. I'm working with Carlotta to find places to show this beautiful show which has about 28 photographs and um, is about respect for beliefs, religions, and rituals, uh, and crosses over nicely. Um, my two legacy grants said so. <laughs> for the uh, peace testimony of Quakers. And um, so this is one of the things that we're doing and that's sort of business as usual in a way. Uh, if there's interest, I have a PDF of the entire show or I can send you to a link uh, afterwards. Uh, the other thing I did is I decided, well, I have a wonderful studio. I have a library filled with books I've read and those I haven't. And that what I could do is I could work in my studio. Um, I'm in my studio now because it's air conditioned. It's the only place in the house that's air conditioned. And I put white cloths behind so you don't have to look at all my machinery. Um, so I started to think um, just in a, in a very abstract way, which I don't usually do, um, so that it wouldn't be content driven. And so it would be about the colors and the shapes, the feeling that it generated. And some people did yoga. Um, I connected with friends uh, all over the world through Zoom. Um, and um, one of them was in Italy and, the, and where quarantine was really frightening. She couldn't leave the house if, unless they called ahead to go shopping. And she would do uh, yoga, but I just watched. <laughs> and so this is my, my kind of yoga, um, to try to, to center and to try to feel out where I was. And it was called May a Simple Light Rise from a Complicated Darkness. Uh, that was the first of about 20 small ones that I've made. And then came the riots about what, two months into uh, quarantine. My personal feeling is that uh, the quarantine uh, focused people on essentials. You know, we couldn't leave the house. We grocery shopped almost never. And people got into cooking <laughs> and uh, listening to music and watching Netflix and things like this. And to my shock, I turned on the TV, my mistake, and um, Monday on the 25th, I saw this. And I thought, I, I, I can't believe that I'm watching this. H how is this happening? One, how is this happening? Two, how is it on TV? Why is nobody doing anything? Why is this happening? And in eight minutes, George Floyd was dead. And I'd watched the whole thing. I, I don't think I've still gotten over this. And I think that the, the uh, quarantine had focused people and quieted people to such an extent that it acted like a funnel. And with this, it exploded. And um, here's a disclaimer. My brother lived in St. Paul for 33 years. And with his new girlfriend, he's 59 to her 56. Um, they bought a new house in 1915 and in a new neighborhood across the Mississippi River in Minneapolis. And all of this that you're about to see happened in their new neighborhood. Uh, where everything was burned down um, was a 10 minute bike ride. Um, and it was where my brother was glad to have a post office he could walk to or bike to, uh, restaurants, movie theaters, everything. The next day, there were peaceful protests. And so the question remains, what happened? More peaceful protests. This is Wednesday, two days later. And this is a Native American building, apartment building that was under construction that was burned to the ground. And here, people are uh, cordoned off. Everything's relatively peaceful. You've got you know, the American police in their usual gear. And this on Thursday, the 28th, 
is a downtown Minneapolis protest. Uh, for those who don't live in Minneapolis, this is a, a bridge because it gets so cold there and nobody wants to walk outside. So they have lots of these in the downtown area to connect uh, up office buildings like the ones my brother works in. So it took two days for things to start burning down. How did it go from peaceful to non-peaceful? Well, this is where I have inside information. Now, whatever you think of Facebook, mine is mostly artists and um, musicians, writers, people like that, scholars. And then my brother and his girlfriend and their friends, most of whom I know. And so I started to see these things pop up. And this was the first one. And I thought, <laughs> You know, I mean, we're supposed to wear masks outside, but who has something like this? And who uses an umbrella? And you can see in his hand, this is a sledgehammer that he also has. And you can see somebody here, uh, looks like a Rastafarian, uh, encountering him. And so I received these two, two posts on my email from my brother's friends. And there were many, many things going on. And it talked about this man who had methodically, and some, I don't have the videos, posted him just methodically breaking the windows like this. And um, who's methodical like this? And so this was the first building to be set on fire. And the protests that were peaceful started in front of the police station. And um, this is a place called the Auto Zone, where you can see it on PBS News right here, Auto Zone. This is where he started here. And uh, everybody on um, the Facebook from Minneapolis was saying that he's not like anybody else. You know, he's methodical. And um, uh, it was yesterday, two days ago, July 8th in the New York Times, I got this first on a link. It said, Minneapolis poli uh, police link the umbrella man, which is this man, to white supremacy groups uh, that he smashed store windows with a sledgehammer to provoke racial unrest. And I would say that was very successful. In a short time after the windows were broken and the auto zone, zone uh, the looting started within hours. And here's the link if, if you wanted that link. So there were many, many um, things, but that was, that was the main one. That was a, a 28th. So the 27th, this is the post office where my brother was so excited to be able to walk to. And I'm not sure what building this was, but it's not there anymore. This is the library. And they have uh, now received donations from all over the world, including mine, to buy new books and to clean it up. What, what, what was lost? The police station, post office, burned to the ground. The library is right here, you can see that. And the Native American Cultural Center, burned. A Native American apartment house being constructed, burned to the ground. Yoga studios, cafes, Target, AutoZone, the Cup grocery store, restaurants, Somali, Hmong, Japanese. It's very um, multicultural. Minnesota is one of two places in the United States that process um, refugees. The other was Portland, Maine, and there were a lot of Somali and Hmong uh, there. Ilhan Omar, the representative, came out of this community, the Somali community. So Thursday, this is the Minneapolis police station. It's still extant. And the demonstrators surround it in the third precinct. It starts to become engulfed in flames. And then the mayor, he's a former civil rights lawyer, Mayor Jacob Frey. And he basically said last night is the result of so much built up anger and frustration. And um, he, uh, at this point on, on Thursday, uh, everything was in flames, about five miles in flames. It went Friday, um, the National Guard came out. It cost them $13 million. At first they were gonna send 500. I was on the phone with my brother and this is his neighborhood. Um, this is an apartment house. They blocked off uh, uh, on Saturday, the National Guard blocked off this end of each street. They asked the residents to go inside their houses and shelter in place. And on the internet, Facebook, uh, my friend's brother, um, said that, and my brother told me the same on the phone call, that they had found huge caches of um, water bottles filled with gasoline in their back alleys. Every house has a backyard and then a back alley with a garage in it where the trash is picked up, where they park. 
And so it's a different construction than say in Boston. And um, they also found wood soaked with gasoline and also caches. The plan was that these cars that were reported by my brother seeing it, his girlfriend seeing it, and on his Facebook friends and mine uh, uh, reporting this, that there were large SUVs and Jeeps coming in from out of state, and that there were lots of really well-heeled um, agitators, out-of-state agitators. These were actually, uh, there were 100 rests made um, just in St. Paul alone in on the following Monday, uh, um, and about 90, percent of them were out of state. They were highly funded. They were well healed. They had brand new cars. And in some cases, they had taken the license plate off, but not in all cases. The National Guard swelled to 2,000 people. They closed, off, they closed off the bridge from the river, from St. Paul to Minneapolis. They closed off the highway. They closed off all the neighborhoods. And my brother evacuated um, his building, uh, his new house, on Saturday, he came back on Sunday. Meanwhile, in Boston, the daytime was peaceful and it mirrored what went on in uh, Minneapolis. And the mayor, Marty Walsh, said he thanked the protesters who exercised their right of free speech effectively and peacefully, making sure everyone hears their message, but said he was angered by the people who came and came into our city, outsiders, and chose to engage in acts of destruction, violence, and undermining their message. So this is the aftermath of um, where the citizens are cleaning up Walgreens, uh, tattoo piercing place. This is the library. This is also the library here. These are taken by my brother's girlfriend, Allie Cress. This is a, a restaurant, rodeo restaurant. And this is on Saturday, just before they abandoned their house because they were so afraid. Um, here's shrines. This is, these are my brother's photographs of, of, of uh, the people made to George Floyd and some people taking pictures. My brother said some of his neighbors had, um, uh, which I suspect this is, had uh, arsenals of their own. Uh, and they were sitting in chairs like this in front of their stores. And those were the only ones that weren't damaged because anybody came close. They had submachine guns, whatever's legal around there. They had that. So these are my, again, my brother's pictures. These are the shrines that people were making, the art that people made. And this monument went up. I'm not, I didn't have enough research on this. Um, this is obviously blocked off. This is the middle of the street. They blocked this off as if it was a park already and the traffic could go around it. And this clenched fish, fist is going to be probably permanent. It's being decided now. And uh, this was Saturday, May 30th. It had been up maybe a day. And it's still, to this day, it's up two, mo uh, two months later. So the third section is, is on monuments. Um, there's been a lot of talk uh, in publications, on television, um, about uh, who's represented by whom, and what do these monuments say and they've been victims and targets. So I decided to take a very personal uh, point of view for this and to start with the Boston Public Garden where I grew up in Boston. Um, and my grandmother, I have a picture somewhere, this is not it, of my grandmother and her mother. Uh, her mother is sitting, uh, standing right in front of this, but a little bit forward. There's a Arlington Street right here and then Newberry Street, where all the fancy hairdresser places and the boutiques are. And uh, it's a, the same period of time, 1903. She's all dressed in black. My, uh, my grandmother was born in 1900, uh, had a big bow that went to her shoulders. She was three years old. And um, they were quite formal on a hot day. And so this is what the George Washington Monument, still there. This is. Uh, contemporary time look like. About 1869, um, it was unveiled, um, and the sculptor uh, was relatively obscure, and uh, it was funded mostly by local citizens uh, and constructed by Massachusetts artists and artisans. And this is a Venus rising in the sea. So, I mean, 
we can say maybe the, who uh, this appeals to is from another time and place. But I think in a, a public space, that's always been the attraction of monuments. As an artist, I know how much it takes to learn the skills, to get the commission, to build it, to get it up. And um, with historians in my family, I, I know how important it is to have our history. Um, also, it's very important to be represented. I never particularly connected to um, these uh, men on horses, but there was one sculpture I liked for the tactility and uh, of the sandstone, the color that was in it, um, which is in Commonwealth Avenue in downtown Boston, but surrounded by highway interconnections now. So it's very hard just to park and to go and see it. I connected to this because my grandfather's from Sweden, and this is a, a very um, storybook type view of Leif Erikson, who came um, in 1000 AD and, and discovered various parts in America. It's, some people say he got as far as Cape Cod. We certainly know that he was in Quebec, Nova Scotia area. And so when I researched this, I found out I was very disappointed to learn who really funded it and why they funded it. At the time, 1887, there were a lot of Italians and Irish coming in, and what we call as the Beacon Hill Blue Bloods. They're, you know, they're the English who were very rich, the Cabots, the Lodges, and so on. Um, they were very disturbed, especially by the Italians that were coming into Boston, and they wanted to create a kind of myth, which is all sculpture is really public sculpture is myth making, um, and they decided they would take it away from um, make it more northern. And so, I mean, Leif Erikson is uh, basically Scandinavian. It's as far north as you can get without being in uh, Antarctic. So I was very disappointed to learn the one representation of my multi-ethnic, but invisible to most people, ethnicity was in fact done for curious and not so kosher reasons. Um, of particular interest to me uh, was this when I was a kid. I think I can wait a minute and make it this one. No, I can't, I can't, I can't change that. Okay, it's a little bit fuzzy, but down here you can see it uh, better. It's on the Black History Trail, which is separate from the uh, Boston History Trail. It's really worth your time to go do it if you're in Boston. Um, this was 1897, so when industrialization after the Civil War was happening and there was finally some money, what happened is uh, three museums opened, the, museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Boston Museum of Art, those three. And they were opened by the new rich industrialist to give the working class a place to connect spiritually with beauty through art. And that was, that was their motivation. And so monument building was also part of it because this of course was a very, very young country. And this is the first documented American regiment. And um, what is this, is Shaw, is it Shaw? Um, so August Saint Baudin is a very, very high-end uh, sculpture, very well known. And again, it was the citizens who donated it. This would have been just people like you and me, as well as rich people. And um, in fact, it wasn't the first real um, voluntary uh, African-American regiment, um, which was 1863. Um, and this was because uh, many soldiers came as far as the North, uh, the Caribbean to the North to join this. It started out of Boston. And these were Northern racist sentiments that kept African-Americans from taking up arms for the United States in the early years of the Civil War. However, a clause from Abraham Lincoln's 1863 Emancipation Proclamation made it possible for the organization of African-American to volunteer regiments. And uh, Robert Gould Shaw family was very wealthy and connected in Boston and New York. They were radical abolitionists and Unitarians. And the African-Americans actually also served in the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. And so, what could possibly be wrong with this? Well, you know, I, I went to art school, so this to me is a no-brainer. Um, essentially, what would be objectionable is that the, uh, Shaw is on a horse leading his men, 
who are on foot and they're African American and he's white. So it's a matter of hierarchy. I mean, people have different reasons for wanting to pull things down. So far, this has not been touched. Uh, I lived in Lexington um, through most of my junior high and high school years. And every year they would recreate the 1776 battle, um, which was considered the first revolutionary battle. And so this sculpture was unveiled in 1900. So we're really talking about 1870, 1900. All of these sculptures that marked uh, public areas were uh, uh, put up. And this is absolutely in the center. This here, the park, is where the battle happened before they went on to Concord. And it was Henry Hudson Kitson who did it. And it was a tribute to Parker and the colonists who armed themselves against the British and the Pequot Indians. And when we went to the museum, which was about every Sunday, I saw this. And I thought it was quite a beautiful statue. Um, and I know as an artist later on, his hands were supposed to be up like this. But that's very hard to do without them falling. So they ended up down as you see them because structurally that was possible and this was um called um uh appeal to the great spirit it's right in front of the museum and then you can't see it but over the front door which is behind it there is a a, a pharaoh's head uh from a sandstone monument um the boston museum was one of the first to support archaeology in egypt so this is what i saw and there are there are serious questions about this. Cyrus Dallin, there's now a museum in Arlington, argued the piece should, uh, uh, the director argued the piece should be reinterpreted in context of today. That's what we're really talking about. And then in the Boston Globe in uh, July, uh, Joseph Zordon, a former curatorial intern at the MFA and a member of the Bad River Ojibwe Nation, uh, the F essays published on the website of the museum. He described the harm that the, the piece represents, the great appeal to the spirit. He writes beautifully, Dallin, uh, who by the way, was from out west, and he was so rough and ready that when he came to the art schools in Boston, he was considered beneath contempt uh, because he was so crude. Um, and he lived and was raised around the Native Americans in, in the West. And so he felt like he was uh, valorizing them. But this is what Joseph Zordon thinks in July 2020. Dallin has taken our grief as indigenous peoples and cast and immobilized it in bronze, cursed to hang in the air forever, with lips parted and eyes frozen wide open. So. So far, nobody's hit this. And then, this is in the South End, which used to be houses for the very rich and then became tenement houses and apartments for the uh, poor. And then housing projects were built in the mm, 60s and 70s. And so people moved out of dilapidated townhouses into these structures. And so now today, it's, it's a mix of um, very rich who've done over these 19th century townhouses and a lot of African-American population that lives there. This is a, a emancipation group at Harriet Tubman Square in Boston. And uh, this sculpture, I forget when it was put up, but it was, it was in the last, I think, 15 years. And it's quite beautiful. And it, it has this little um, park all to itself, very small. And this is Edmund Berry Gaither, who's the director and curator of Boston's Museum of the National Center for African-American Arts. He said, public space has always been a battle terrain, especially for those with really progressive points of view. And he said, public space generally reflects the voice and the vision of the status quo. And what does that do? You'll find facile explanations of the relationship between one group and another that are simply false to human experience. And this was also subject to um, violence uh, it, it was uh, harmed during the riots. Um, and then uh, we have uh, a now headless uh, Christopher Columbus in uh, the Christopher Columbus Park, which is on the edge of a traditionally Italian neighborhood that before that was traditionally Jewish. And before that, I think it went, was Irish. Um, and so this went up 
uh, recently. Did I, I didn't even put the date. Um, so anyway, uh, I think, yeah, 1997, this was erected. And it, during the riots in Boston, he became headless. And um, one person said that he is not a beacon of American fortitude, bravery, or discovery. He's a patron saint of colonial violence. Leave the statue up and let the real conversation begin. So Marty Walsh has decided to uh, store it away to avoid recklessness and you know talk about restoration of it and then let the serious conversations begin and maybe a recontextualization. Harvard University Law School was founded by the largest slave owner in Massachusetts. Royal was his last name with two L's. He had slaves in the Caribbean and he decided to um, make a house next to Cambridge in the town of Medford. It's now um, a museum that has a lot of people come and talk about slavery, including slavery in the North. And um, I, I think that the context of, of talking I, I, um, about what should be done in that particular case, they talked about taking his name off of the front of the law school. And I thought that was erasure of history, which bothers me personally a lot. And that what should happen is inside there should be a very large uh, explanation of who this man was, what his implication for slavery was, and what the uh, uh, amount of money that Harvard got from it. I mean, essentially, we can say that uh, in, in my upbringing in, in the North, in the Boston area, we were told that slavery was a Southern problem. And so it's very interesting for me to read many books and hear many scholars in the last 20 years talk about exactly what kind of slavery happened in Boston and who was responsible. There's lots of books. So monuments and uh, the Metropolitan Museum has hired uh, an artist from Kenya who lives in New York. And uh, she decided to use uh, a, a African and Western art um, and it's called a karyatid. It's those figures that hold up uh, like columns, hold up the Parthenon or the Acropolis in Greece. So they have a long history. And then these coils are meant to be like the coils in the neck of African women that separate the head from the body. And uh, these are temporary installations that are there longer because of uh, the quarantine. And so she put a disc, which often on the mouth, there would be a, a mouth disc that would make, stretch the mouth open like that. And so she, moved, she took that inspiration and she used it on the head. And this is a mirrored disc so that light will shine on the disc. And it's a it's very feminist uh, kind of uh, presentation. It's celestial, it's humanoid, and she calls it the new ones will free us. And I think this is what you would see if you walked up the big steps of the Metropolitan Museum. So anti-monuments. Here is the destruction that we saw and the anger that we saw and the alienation that we saw for monuments that are everywhere. Um, about two years before this 1818 Declaration of Independence painting by John Trumbull, uh, which is in, um, I think it's, it's in, not in the White House, I mean, maybe in Congress. She, uh, the artist uh, Arlene uh, Parsa uh, put red dots over all of the founding fathers at the Declaration of Independence that had slaves. You can see there's very few that did not have slaves. Three quarters of them owned slaves. Okay, now in my research on, online, in this research online, I found, um, this headline, projections at the Lee Monument offer peace in times of violence. And I thought, so peace in times of conflict, there we are. It's come full circle. And um, she talks about uh, uh, in this article on July 5th to 2020, um, Aaron Parker, who smoked a cigarette and looked at all the graffiti that you'll see all over the uh, Robert E. Lee Monument who was revered as a not so bad enslaver who fought for states' rights. Uh, and um, he looked up and he saw the projections that you're about to see and he felt empowered as a black man. And um, that these are anchored by tributes to people who fought slavery and lined by old money homes. 
um, that's the context of the neighborhood. And so you're gonna see these. And the projections, by the way, were an artist who's white and another artist who's black. So Dustin Klein is white and Alex Creaky is uh, African-American. So this is before in Richmond, Virginia. And this is after with George Floyd and Black Lives Matter on it. You can see all the graffiti that wasn't there before. So I showed you all the things that I grew up with, right? I mean, as an artist, I can say I was horrified. Right? As someone who loves history, I was like, well, you know, this can be cleaned, that can be cleaned. And then as a futurist, I thought, this is some of the best art I've seen in I don't know how long. So we can say I'm a split personality. Um, so the governor ordered the removal of the statue, of course, and a judge blocked the decision, um, the Democratic governor, uh, for 10 days. And uh, the spokesperson for the Sons of Confederate Veterans, I think this is quite good, he condemned the toppling of public works of art and likened losing the Confederate statues to losing a fam family member. I mean, George Washington meant very little on his horse to me, and I'm second generation American, it could have been enough time. But it was Leif Erikism that really moved me. And then when I found out that it was Blue Bloods that were English and rich that wanted to have a farther north representation of America to avoid all those Italians and Irish that were coming into Boston, I was less than pleased. If the, the Indian came down, I would be less than pleased. My aunt lived on a Navajo reservation the last 25 years of her life after the Smithsonian hired her to make uh, paintings of the vanishing tribes. Um, but then there were other feelings. So look what they did. They, these are all projections. This has gone on for a couple of weeks. How powerful is that? How amazing is that? And the idea of projection actually started with a Polish artist who's at MIT for the last uh, decade or two, uh, Christoph, and he did projections on the Bunker Hill Monument in Boston. That was another project he did. So this is a, a kind of an acceptable form in art, these projections, recontextualizing a monument known to everybody uh, with very important information. The time is always right to do what's right. Slavery is the next thing to hell, Harriet Tubman, MLK. And then Frederick Douglass, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And then LGBTQ, there's so many letters now. I remember when it was simpler. Um, yeah, so, and then this is Malcolm X. And then this is Angela Davis. It was nice to see a woman there. And I don't know if anybody didn't see this. And these aren't necessarily artists. This is whoever showed up. I thought this was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And then from, a height, you could see this all the way to the, I think it's the Wash, White, White House is right there. And the monument's right there. So there was breathtaking. So to end it, in an optimistic note, even though we lost John Lewis this week, in the New York Times, it was, uh, it was published, I don't know if you can see this. I don't know where I am on the screen. If you can see this, New York Times. He said he wanted this essay, his last essay, to be published the day of his funeral. And he said, together you can redeem the soul of our nation. Though I am gone, I urge you to answer the highest calling of your heart and to stand up for what you truly believe. He was born in 1940, and he died this year, 2020. And this this essay should i read the essay give me the hands up or hands down no thank you so much my voice is about to go so here's the essay and how how can i get out of this stop share yeah okay i'm back so comments please some kind of com any comments Hi, I'm, I'm Betsy Elizabeth in the picture. Uh, I 
confused as to what exactly the whole thing logic of your presentation was, but I thought the images and the way everything fit together was brilliant in just the impression it created of fitting what's happening now into a history. And uh, I really appreciate the effort you put into that. Thank you. Uh, I, I tried to connect uh, the dots of, of quarantine, which uh, put us all in our homes and connected us globally, um, and also created a, a, a space where I feel like we became more, I hate to use the word centered, uh, quieted, less distracted, although much distraction was needed to quell the underlying anxiety of a world that didn't know what was going on. And I feel that, uh, again, I feel that that pressure, that created a pressure cooker of people. It's normal to go to the grocery store and have a little talk, talk with somebody and then go to do something else and have a little chat. And this is, makes our life have uh, depth. And we lacked that. Um, and the physicality of being physically present with somebody is vastly different than being on Zoom um, or other formats. And so I think that everything that happened uh, created a kind of funnel through which all that pressure came up and exploded. And uh, this also happened with the women's uh, demonstrations that started in the United States. I can't remember where they started. And then they were in Europe and then they were in, in Japan and Asia. So this is a contemporary phenomena, and that's what I was trying to do to talk about representation and, and um, what happened in, I think, Minnesota. I had a, a particular lens that is just a couple of months later coming out. Uh, I was absolutely horrified when my best friend, who's now in, back in Brazil, um, best friend of 15 some years, uh, Anna said to me, on Facebook, well, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, when I was so horrified by my brother's new neighborhood going up in flames. I mean, he has no post office anymore. So I tried to give a very personal uh, view with facts, and um, I know that statistics can be moved in any direction that you want to make them go. And so I hope by giving my personal uh, point of view and experience that it opens something for you, a dialogue about monuments, about representation. Who's represented, who's excluded. Quarantine excluded a lot of people and the African Americans were excluded more than anybody else by death. They died more than, than anybody. Okay. Any thoughts? And I just want to remind uh, friends that uh, your thoughts certainly are welcome, but we are doing this in the in the context of, of Quaker worship as well. So there's no reason to jump in right away and and um, so we can continue in that way. I appreciated the uh, references to the outside agitators in Minneapolis and uh, just wonder why, it, it, at least maybe I missed it, but I haven't seen much of that in, in the national news. And it's a very strong suspicion that it's going on a lot of other places.
um, the New York Times article on the 28th showed that the Minneapolis police have now made the connection with uh, those Facebook images from my brother's friends who lived in that Minneapolis neighborhood who were noticing that umbrella man methodically. It was no passion. It was the methodicalness and all dressed in black and with an umbrella and a gas mask, right? I mean, he, he was very striking. So people took photographs of him. They went up to talk to him. They couldn't stop him. And then they started noticing other things. So this is, this is the, the neighborhood where my brother lives. It's the neighborhood he moved into at the beginning of April after living 33 years in St. Paul. Um, and only on the 28th of July on New York Times, when I was researching this, because I didn't see it right away in, in the paper edition that I get every day, um, that's why I posted uh, that on that same slide. So it took from the 28th of May to the 28th of July, two months, which actually in terms of crime is pretty good turnaround. It means they're really, really focused on it. I've been very impressed by Minneapolis as a, a very multicultural city, but I think it has all the problems any other place has. They just are, I think, more proactive in dealing with them. Obviously not entirely successful. So. The reason you haven't heard it, I know our president projects all the time when he says lock her up about Hillary Clinton. I mean, he's really deflecting interest from us locking him up. And we have lots of good reasons for that. And so when they talk about Antifa, there's no Antifa. It's a, a name that was concocted around the Seattle uh, demonstrations or riots, whatever. There's no organization of Antifa. You know, he's really deflecting interest again from uh, these people obviously are funded. Every time, uh, you know, there's a demonstration, the right wing says George Soros is funding it. And I'm thinking, is this true? Why did I give my friend's daughter $50 to go to the women's demonstration? A Quaker friend, right, his daughter. You know, if George Soros could have given me the money, that would be really great. There's no such, there's no such thing. These people were funded. These people were organized. And I don't think they were just in uh, Minneapolis. They started there. And so it's just coming out in mainstream news. In Minneapolis, they've made connections to his white supremacist group. They made connections to a motorcycle gang that he belongs to. You know, I mean, with digital media, things, things aren't so difficult to figure out. I hope that answers something. Caroline. Hi, Caroline. Thank you very much, Erica. Uh, your skill and your lens, as this common term is now, is very um, impressive in what you are able to put into a timeline for all of us that was very traumatic. So this was, I believe, from my perspective in trying to understand a personal gift of what you went through from the artistic perspective, reflecting on where we are today. Peace in times of conflict, that's your title. And I think that we are all challenged to find some glory and some beauty and some restoration or we won't be able to go forward. I won't say very much else about it. I'm being in Boston, I'm familiar with the statues and your blend of being such a widely read newspaper person was very exciting to me to see how you followed all of the reports and could capture the statues. I followed some of them. I was deeply, very much sorrowful after George Floyd's murder. And so I did have to take to my bed. And that Larry suggested I do that so that I would stop crying perhaps yeah. and trembling. Yours is a different perspective and it's very helpful as Quakers 
to hear different voices and to see different pictures and to continue to have different discussions. With that, I'll leave you with a thank you. Thank you, Caroline. I really appreciated um, uh, what you brought out about um, having a conversation around monuments and what is possible and what is not possible when you leave a, a monument up, when you take a monument down. Um, I, I agree with you that um, the art that was done with the projections on the monument of Robert R. E. Lee is tremendously um, powerful. Um, you know, it, 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 as, as, as a gay person, I, maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but you know, I remember my mother saying, oh, I don't know why, this was before I came out, why gay people have to use that word gay? Um, it already means something. And I said, Mom, that's what gay people want to be called. Maybe get over that. Um, and it was a reclaiming, in a way, of, of some power and space. Um, I think that maybe there's something similar going on uh, w with these monuments. Um, and... Uh, do we stifle a needed conversation by taking some of them down? Uh, do we stifle conversation by leaving some of them up? Um, and how do we sort that all out? So I, I, I thank you for a really um, rich presentation in general, but I, I just wanted to bring out in particular that uh, line of discussion, which I find um, uh, very, very thought provoking. So thank you. Oh, thank you. I'd like to thank everybody for, you know, actually showing up and giving me the opportunity to make this PowerPoint and to think through what, um, as Caroline said, she took to bed. <laughs> I took to the PowerPoint. I took to images as an artist, as a thinker, I think through images um, to, to work out what this quarantine is what those riots that destroyed my brother's new neighborhood is, what happens to all these artworks, these public artworks for a public conversation that we all need to have and about representation. So this offered me a, a great chance to think through things. Two simple comments. I hope you have an opportunity to share this with others in other venues. I hope any of the participants who might facilitate having that happen do so. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Philip. Oh, on, on that point <laughs> about sharing uh, talks, I, I, I glazed over it. Um, in February 26th, uh, I had organized something called Wampanoag Speak. And uh, there was me doing a talk about land, particularly the West Falmouth Quakers who moved into that part of Cape Cod that was Wampanoag land and basically still is. Um, and then there were three Wampanoags. There was Gail Mellox, who's speaking uh, this week at sessions. And there was Joan Tavares Avant, uh, who's a Wampanoag historian, lives at the end of my street. And, um, oh my God, I, I'm forgetting the name right now. A, a woman who um, talked about Wampanoag spirituality. And if you go on, type in West Falmouth Library, and uh, then go uh, to a talk, Wampanoag Speak, they have the entire thing in video. And also my PowerPoint, which admittedly was too long and uh, the various reasons that I spoke a little bit longer than I wanted to that night, but it's quite wonderful to see. So you can, that's up there and available on the internet. 
we do maintain on the QIF website um, a place where contributions can be uh, posted other than the uh, books and pamphlets that we formally publish. Um, you might consider uh, sharing that through uh, the QIF website. Okay, I think uh, Charles Tannenbaum might be helpful in that regard. Thank you. I'll do that. I, I, I'd like to comment, but I want to first correct something, and that is that my name is Shelley Tannenbaum, and my husband's name is Charlie Blanchard. So just to keep that straight, we're not one unit. Um, <laughs> And, but yes, we would be happy to um, post any of the um, presentations that are done in the summer research seminar. Uh, those who are interested, who would like to have something posted on our website afterwards, will we'll, uh, send us the material you'd like posted and we will make that happen. And at this point, Charlie is probably the recipient of that material. Is that right, Charlie? We're in the same house right now, but we're in different rooms. <laughs> you, can also, you can also post links like that on the, on the bulletin board um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then those of us on QIF can sort of see, go through that afterwards and as, as uh, a source of material, we might want to then also share on the website. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really appreciate it the Google Doc that Jeff has set up. I think that'll make things much easier for all of us to have everything in one place and be able to access it, access it all week. And then uh, we'll check with you later to see if you're comfortable with us posting any of that on the website. Um, <clears throat> Erica, I really appreciate how you've put so many different things together and, and give us a, a help us see this all in context. Um, but it's making it hard for me to make any comments because uh, there was just so much presented that I, I don't know where to start. And, but I do really appreciate seeing it all together in the context of what we've been living through and are still living through. Um, I, I think I wanna focus on one thing because I've been talking a lot in the, the presentations I've been giving about COVID-19 and the uprising and how it relates to climate change and issues like that. Um, and I've been calling this an uprising rather than riots. And I think it's an important distinction that um, the violence that occurred, the destruction that occurred, some of it was from people who were have just so outraged at the end of their whatever, couldn't do anything else. And some of it was provoked as you've brought to many of our attention. I had heard a lot of these reports, especially early on. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there was a lot of provocation in many cities, but also in a tremendous amount of outrage and frustration. Um, but I've tended to focus more on this amazing upwelling of um, change, of recognizing that things have to change dramatically, radically, and how I haven't felt more hope than I'm feeling now. Yep. In, and also terrified that it could go very, very wrong, but also so much hope right now that we're going to see real change, that we already are seeing change in people's hearts about um, awareness of the situation in the um, communities of not color, of people who had been blissfully um, ignoring the horrendous situation we've been living in for centuries. Um, we are seeing so much more awareness now than we have six months ago. Yeah. That, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, the artistry that you have shown us, like the, I hadn't seen those projections on the statues. Uh, it was just so beautiful yeah. to see 
that kind of creativity, that kind of um, use of, of art and um, public presentation that makes a statement as soon as you see it. It's like you just know it in your bones that what, what they're demonstrating to us in that kind of work. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling on, but just to say there's so much um, change that's happening right now that um, I'd love to see some of that fervor, some of that um, upwelling of political awareness um, be added to this already amazingly rich presentation that you've given us. And thank you so much for sharing it. Language, language is really important, and maybe there's something inflammatory in my uh, <laughs> my nature that I, I chose uh, riots because I was still horrified to watch my brother after 33 years living across the river. Finally, he could go to a neighborhood and just walk or bike everywhere, and it all goes in flames and is destroyed. And and you know, he said they're not going to put the, the post office back together. There's no money for that, right? So I'm, I'm horrified. To me, there were riots, and a lot of it was instigated. But uprisings, maybe it could be a, another sliver, because basically it is an uprising on both sides. And uh, I think uh, Americans are, are very good at a violent dialogue. I, I wish it were otherwise. So where is, where is the peace is a good question. Ellen here, Keith's wife, I've been listening. Keith's oh, sister lived in that same neighborhood in Minneapolis that your brother is in. Who does? Keith's sister. Oh. Well, Ellen, if you could come a little closer to your microphone, we're having trouble hearing you. I don't know. It's hard to hear. Can you hear me now? That's better. better. Keith's sister lives in that same neighborhood. And so was witness to the demonstrations. And in our conversations with her, our sense was that she, she was with the demonstrations. She did not feel fear at the violence. Instead, she kept expressing, we live a strong, we have a strong community here. And so my question to you, was your brother having that same experience of strong community? It was manifested in the ways in which the citizens went out and sat in front of storefronts during those demonstrations when people were going through and destroying property. And she expressed time after time how she felt the strength of that particular neighborhood. And I wondered if you could comment on that with regard to your brother's experience as well. Well, they moved in in early April and it, uh, it was a totally renovated house and they had been putting things in. Uh, they haven't sold his house in uh, St. Paul yet um, for the previous month. So it was pretty easy move in. And they were both working at home. Um, and in this place they have to uh, uh, a study for each one of them on the second floor. And they were working all that week. And then they break, they get up early and they break from work around 3.30. So I don't know in particular, except that um, my brother um, uh, did say that his neighbors told him they had submachine gun. I don't know the language of all the guns, but the, like, not just a usual rifle. And they were sitting in front of their buildings in those chairs, uh, one of the photographs I had, um, with their guns. And when they did that, nobody that was from the outside agitator came and tried to hurt their buildings. Um, so I know that part. And those photographs I showed of the aftermath were taken by my brother and his girlfriend who otherwise were working all week. And I think that they went out on their bikes otherwise, but they were also in quarantine still, you know, and would have been wearing a mask if they were on a bike or taking photographs. And I know Saturday night, um, I, I called Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Saturday night, I got my brother. His girlfriend was packing to leave for a friend's house. I said, what are you doing? And he was too upset. I said, no, no, you're going with her. 
take two cars, take, take your laptop so you can work and take an overnight bag. Just, you know, if you're leaving, just leave. And at that point was when um, through the Facebook communication and then with my brother confirming it, everybody had been told to go to their back alleys where their garages are behind their um, yards and to look for these large, I mean, huge caches of water bottles filled with gasoline, wood soaked, uh, gasoline soaked wood um, that were the next uh, target of the outside agitators, which was to take down the neighborhood. And when he was leaving on that Saturday, there were 500 promised National Guard coming and they ended up getting 2,000, far more than they thought they would from neighboring uh, surrounding areas. And it cost them million, $13 million for this. And they blocked off the ends of all the streets. My brother was like, you know, Lake Street. Is, his house is two, two, two houses from Lake Street, at this East Lake Street where everything happened. So, I mean, it was frightening because it was their place where they had just moved in. It was the place that they were working. They didn't really know their neighbors yet. They knew some people who owned stores. And I mean, they were on the side of, of the peaceful demonstrators and, and, and the, the agitators. I mean, there were so many people saying, have you noticed there are cars, you know, brand new SUVs and brand new Jeeps coming in from out of state. I mean, this was all, you, I don't know, it was sort of like 1776 when the Minutemen were just farmers with a family and a house far from somebody else. And they all got together and they, they defended themselves against the Redcoats, against the British. So this had a very modern day flavor for that. And that there was peaceful demonstrations is like well documented. It was huge. Days and days and days of it. And the cleanup, the photographs by my brother and separately from his girlfriend, was showing how community oriented this community was cleaning up their library and, and couldn't do anything for the post office, the police station. So I, I don't know if that answers it. I'm, st I'm still disturbed by this. This destruction disturbs me. It, it's not that I don't understand violence because when something doesn't work on my computer, I mean, my first instinct is to find a hammer and put the computer out of its misery and then I would feel better. So I get that. I understand that, you know. I, um, I noticed uh, Gray has his hand raised. This gives me the opportunity to talk about hand raising. Um, we normally will not use, um, whoops, let me, we normally will not use the raise hand function that Zoom allows. Um, so you can just speak out of this, uh, the silence in, in turn, however, uh, the clerk of a, of a session may decide in order to manage uh, the flow of conversation to use that, to ask people to use that function. But that is not the case now. So you still may just speak um, out of the silence. With that said, I want to know, Gray, if you had intended um, to be called upon and have something to, to, to share. Yeah, I, I, I did want to jump right in uh, in the dialogue that was going back and forth. Um, I, uh, I thank you very much, Erica, for the presentation. It's just lots of helpful organization of, of images and details and narrative and structure in terms of trying to process all the things that have been going on um, in the recent months. Um, I, it, it gives rise to a question for me. I'm not sure I can put it um, as clearly as I would like, but um, I guess it has to do with a, a, a tension that's present in uh, in many, if not most, or all uh, situations of peacemaking, where if you're not just interested in pacifying people, but you want some genuine peace to result from the dialogue and interaction, it's important to, to sort of move between two modes. And one is where you're sort of mediating between different points of view and the other is where you're advocating for people whose point of view has been silenced. You know, and I think both are really important in the process of peace. And often um, Quakers and others um, need to be sensitive to the situation and context and know when it's appropriate to be trying to mediate between groups and help them listen more deeply to each other and when it's important to 
create space and advocate for uh, uh, the disempowered or people who are marginalized and the like. And uh, I think this is one of those situations where we really need to be doing both. Um, it's really, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement and related movements have created a situation in which lots of people are trying to empower themselves and are empowering, trying to empower others to speak and advocate. And it's just really, really wonderful. And it's creating great openings. And I think it's, it's associated with a kind of transitions we're doing through the, the COVID quarantine process and so on that are really making clear to everybody that real fundamental substantive change is possible. You know, when we think about problems like militarism and patriarchy and racism, and climate change, often the response is, it's just so global, it's just so enmeshed in our whole lives. How could we change that? Maybe 50 years from now, it'll be better. You know, that, that's often a response from people. And yet, you know, we've discovered that we can shut our country down, basically. That we can stop sending kids to school. That we can change the way we eat and shop and do all that and do and and raise money to help do it you know to raise a billion or two billion dollars over the weekend roughly you know i mean is when the motivation and clarity is there really dramatic change is possible so we're, we're we're sort of navigating that moment how do we you know orchestrate the kind of change that that we really want and and and, and, and advocate for it and part of the challenge is, is that um we have an election coming up, there's a real tendency to want to be advocates and, and to just push for what seems right. You know, on the other hand, it, um, it will be very unfortunate if, for example, um, you know, a significant percentage of the United States that has been supporting Donald Trump gets left behind in the dialogue, gets feeling that they have been excluded or shut down they're not being listened to. And uh, some of them are voices that, you know, it's, it's probably really not appropriate to listen to because they're just so far up the deep end that persuasion is not possible and they're not really interested in truth. But it's, it's always important to, to be cautious about making that judgment about somebody. And it's really clear that there are a lot of people in the US who are, who are uneasy with tearing down statues, who think somehow that their tradition is being trashed who um, I guess my, my temptation is to say that they, they need some fundamental kinds of therapy. And I, I guess I just don't know, I, I, um, in practice, it can be really difficult. How do you listen to, you know, in that kind of therapeutic way and, and do the kind of listening project kinds of work that Quakers have done in the past with the militarists, for example. How, how do you do that in a way that can actually get racists to show up at a meeting, to share their actual views, and to consider changing them. How, you know, how, how do you do that? In the context of at the same time, uh, trying to empower and honor all the forms of, of victimization and abuse and other things that, that other people who are part of that dialogue have suffered through. Um, and so I, uh, it's in the context of that sort of basic tension that occurs that I'm, I'm wondering about monuments. Um, it seems to me that, that monuments might be a, one interesting and important place to be trying to negotiate those two styles of, or two aspects of peacemaking uh, in the time that we're in now. And partly because they aren't, because they're public, they remain still a place where sort of people from different sides, people who perceive themselves as polarized from each other, they drive through the same city street, they see the same monument. So even though they live in completely different worlds in Facebook or in their news media outlets, they confront each other in these public spaces of monuments. And so I, I, my question is that if there are examples that you know of Erica or that other folks can speak of where some kind of truth and reconciliation kind of process that really allows for both functions of peacemaking to occur together, or that's, that's been possible through the ways that the building or the deconstructing or the 
debating around or wrapping <laughs> Christo's plastic or whatever around monuments has occurred. Well, the polarization that we have in this country, and uh, I think the social isolation, isol isolation that we have that's been accelerated by quarantine um, is a really difficult thing to get out of. There's a feeling in this country that we don't have to have a unified um, medical insurance for everybody. That we don't even need to have a unified um, unemployment for everyone. I'm a contract worker. You know, I was I was facing no income until um, coming in until uh, Nancy Pelosi decided that I was a real human being with a real need. You know, uh, and there are mostly at college level, 75% of, of the faculty are contract workers, part time no benefits. And this is something that's grown in, in the last 30 years since supply side economics started. And there was a, a freezing of, of salaries. So to make people feel part of, of, of the equation, we have to change some really basic elements. And the $600 a week, in fact, brought more people to the table. In fact, they could buy more food, pay more bills, Right? Because we've economically marginalized people for 30 years ongoing. And the middle class is also part of this, even if they're working. So we, we have structural issues, but we're supposedly the richest country in the world and ever known. So we have the tools, but we're not using them. Uh, that's a huge problem. As far as monuments go, there's this new area in Boston and it's built on landfill <laughs> and it's skyscrapers. I'm just blown away. It's the place where the sea will absolutely has already risen two years ago. And I was, I couldn't, ex I went off Cape just to drive through this. I, I couldn't believe it. I had to see it. And all the water downtown was all over the place. Cars, you know, was up to here. And so they built a new area um, on, on this built-in land and they put public sculpture up. And it's fun stuff. I mean, it's something out of cartoons. It's brightly colored, it's animals, you know, non-objectionable. I'm sure someone could object, but they're not people on horses, you know, representing some ideology. They're just, like I said, somebody will object, but they're pretty, uh, pretty innocuous and, and fun now. So that may be where we go in the next few years because everything's so weighted. I think another idea would be to give uh, people chances to project on the monuments. The ones in uh, the Robert E. Lee statue, the two artists are doing, one African-American, one white, um, has been ongoing for two months and it's with permission. And uh, one of them was an art student, the other wasn't. You don't have to be an art student. You just have to have the right tech. So I don't have an answer for that other part of the question. Hey, maybe um, I could just follow up just briefly, because uh, one, one thought that's occurred as you've been talking, Erica, is um, in some ways for early Quakers, um, this was a, they, they had this same kinds of concerns. And they, it's just occurring to me now that part of what they did was uh, to go to monuments called steeple houses and question the nature and legitimacy of those. And they would do that at, at ritually prescribed times, the times of worship. Um, and um, it was sort of going to the home turf, as it were, of the, the opposition. Um, By steeple houses, do you mean the congregational churches? I mean the Episcopal churches, yeah. Episcopal. But that's especially the Episcopal, yeah, that were kind of state authorized. So that at the, at the time, yeah, at the time they would refer to them as steeple, the Quakers would refer to them as steeple houses rather than churches. Oh, <laughs> so, because of the structure. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And because the idea was that by putting a steeple on it, somehow at the time, I think people believed it made this, the space more holy. But the view of Quakers was that, they're, that every space is holy. And the, the steeple function was also to point to this hierarchical kind of principle of governance 
so the idea was in part, I think that um, in the church, wherever it was sitting down lower, there would be somebody up in a pulpit who was closer to the steeple and closer to God, closer to the archbishop, closer to the king, who would be passing the messages down from the pulpit, you know. And the early Quakers idea was, well, actually, there's that of God in everyone and everyone, you know, sort of equal in access to the divine. Um, so they, they really, it was the sort of physical structures of the churches that embodied the hierarchy and the patern patriarchy that they were objecting to, that uh, in part that provided sort of the, the site for them to, um, to refuse to take their hats off and honor the church in a way that people would uh, have expected and to stand outside when people exiting the church and speak against what had been said in the church. Or sometimes they would actually go into the church and interrupt a service and say, I'm sorry, but you're, you're quoting this, this from John, but uh, Lucas, uh, Luke says this and Matthew says that. And, and what canst thou say? Well, that I didn't know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, anyway, I've other, it may, I just mentioned it because it might be that for others that sort of going back to our history and past and thinking about, well, how, how did Quakers, early Quakers manage to negotiate speaking peacefully using thee and thou, which were sort of the intimate, friendly pronouns. How do they negotiate all that with these people in, the, in these public spaces that church has created? The courthouses were another place that really were kind of monuments to justice that they went in and challenged by refusing to take their hats off and stuff. So they contested those spaces, but without tearing them down, but by contesting them somehow, I don't know. Sorry to run on, but um, um, so welcome back, everyone. Um, I think uh, I would like to proceed now with introductions. So we've done that, and then we will have time to go back into worship and continue sharing um, and then continue the discussion. The really nice discussion we we. <clears throat> have had on, on Erica's presentation. So um, I think uh, what I am going to try to do is to call on you. Otherwise, it gets a, I, that's how I think it works best. I will start by telling you that I'm Jeff Garver. I am a member of Montreal Monthly Meeting and a member of the CLIF uh, Board of Trustees. And Shelley, why don't I turn to you? Hi, I'm Shelley Tannenbaum. I'm a member of uh, Strawberry Creek Meeting in Berkeley, California. And I'm also the uh, on the Quaker Institute for the Future Board. Um, up until this year, um, I had been coordinating the summer research seminars with, with help from various other board members. So I am so appreciative of uh, all the work Jeff has put into this and um, just pleased to be a participant and, and <laughs> not in the very middle of it all, but, and thank you so much for, for all you've done, Jeff. Um, I am um, here also as the General Secretary of Quaker Earth Care Witness. Good to be here. Thank you, Shelley. Betsy? Uh, well, I am here as part of Ithaca Monthly Meeting. Um, uh, going to give a presentation uh, along with Judy Lum and Carol Barda and David Zimbrisky. I'm, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Zaramka. So, thank you, Judy. <laughs> and uh, we've been meeting as a COD uh, on and off since last, the last meeting in um, Massachusetts, Falmouth, and I think of that very uh, nostalgically right now. I loved that meeting together. And um, we, I'm presenting on um, regenerative agriculture. And I am already worried because um, Gray Cox is telling me to slow down or everyone to slow down. And I am trying to, to fit it within some amount of time, I don't know, how, how much time do I have? Like 30 minutes? Yeah, that's and, uh, ish, yeah. What? Yeah, about, yeah. It could be a little longer, don't, uh, don't worry about that. Uh, oh. 
we'll 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 uh, make it work. Okay. Well, I've been practicing and seeing timing it. <laughs> I will do my best to be Quakerly and be informative. Thank, thank you, Betsy. Not always easy. <laughs> Thanks, Betsy. Um, Erica, you've had some time already, but uh, I don't want to exclude you from the introductions. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Erica Adams from uh, West Falmouth, uh, month, uh, preparative meeting and sandwich monthly meeting. Um, I uh, moved here in 2000, 2001, something like that. And uh, 19, 2017 and 19, I was given legacy grants, uh, essentially to promote the idea of Quaker uh, peace testimony and uh, diversity and inclusion. Um, uh, to the Chappas Photography Project ex uh, show, uh, Respecto, uh, for, uh, that uh, was made by eight, seven Maya women in Chappas, Mexico. And the director and founder he is here today from Chappas, Mexico, Carlotta Duarte, who I co-curated the show with. Beautiful photographs by Maya women and wonderful statements. Thank, thank you, Erica and Carlotta. Uh, who's joining us from Oaxaca, I think. Carlotta, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, I'm, um, well, in the U.S. people's Carlotta, but it's Carlotta. Um, it was Carlos and I am Carlotta. And uh, I live here in Chiapas, right next to Oaxaca. Although I'm up in the mountains, uh, this, I'm in San Cristobal de las Casas, which is a mile high, over a mile. So it's a very interesting place uh, geographically, low latitude, where the uh, I'm four hours from the Guatemala border. So we're very pretty far down, low latitude, but high altitude where I, where I live. But we have altitude in Chiapas. We have the, I think it's the final remaining tropical jungle uh, in uh, North America is in our state. And as we speak is being reduced by incursions of agriculture. Uh, in any case, I, I'm here in Chiapas and I am very privileged really to participate. I feel very grateful to be included in this, in this gathering and uh, hope on receiving re recordings to share a lot of this, uh, certainly with friends. I feel very fortunate in, in having that and, and having friends who would certainly share and appreciate the articulation of what we've heard today. And I, I'm very uh, happy about that. And just to mention um, that I, several of you mentioning in the interest in general in agriculture, and this as part of the COVID, I think has raised that question for even people in the general public about the, uh, the whole planet and the whole system of the entire planet as a part of it and our negative effects on that. But uh, the, one of the other activities that uh, other offerings that, that uh, Erica has available is a show called Our Food, Nuestra Comida. And it's basically about indigenous people of two ethnic groups. We, we have worked with 13 ethnic groups, um, in Chiapas primarily, but also Oaxaca and Yucatan. My particular show is uh, two ethnic groups, and it shows their food, their culture through the food of the of the uh, of their of their culture, and uh, it's a really a show. And it's been um, traveling around for a long time. It opened at uh, Radcliffe Schlesinger Library of Women's History uh, many years ago, but it's. Uh, it's very worth uh, giving time to. And so if any of you are interested and so on, Erica could um, you know, give you more information about that. Um, but in any case, I'm great, very grateful to be here. And as we move along with this conversation, I have a few uh, comments or questions for Erica. Thank you. Th thank you, Carlotta. And, and either you or Erica, if you wish, could provide information about those things you mentioned um, in, the, in the bulletin board. That would be very welcome. Um, uh, Charlie? Oh, there we go. So, hello everyone. It's great to see everybody. Um, like Betsy, I was thinking fondly of our last summer research seminar in West Falmouth last year and also two years ago in Ithaca. And um, 
it's, it's just nice to see people. So we'll have another in-person summer research seminar at some point, I'm sure, but for now, this is, this is really good. And we get to see Laura Holiday all of a sudden. <laughs> Hi, Laura. <laughs> Hi. I'm still fighting with Zoom. I apologize. <laughs> it's great to see you. Um, it's great so to be here. I'm a member of Strawberry Creek uh, Meeting in Berkeley and also on the QIF um, Board of Directors. Um, normally, I would have brought QIF Focus books to share with you. Um, you can see some of the QIF Focus books over my left shoulder, second shelf from the top there, <laughs> far left. Um, uh, so um, this is something we're going to continue working on. It'll be good to hear the presentation from, from um, the COD that's working on regenerative agriculture, and I, I hope there's another focus book coming out of that at some point. Great, thank you, Charlie. Uh, Claire Adamson. Uh, I'm an architect, a retired architect, and uh, I'm always pleased how the building codes uh, tend to tell people uh, what they expect uh, from uh, the building. I think that we need to build peace the same way uh, and give both sides a chance to express their views and I really love the artistic way of uh, making slideshows. Thank you, Claire. Um, Dale? <clears throat> Dale Bordelon? Yeah, I already introduced myself. I just didn't unmute first. I'm I'm Dale. Howdy, y'all. I'm I'm down here in Texas, and uh, it's good to see all these friendly faces. I uh, uh, I'm sad we can't meet in person. I really am. There's a whole dynamic that changes for me when it's, and I'm also not used to seeing myself talk, which is a little distracting. Um. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation about uh, that uh, presentation that I'm going to present later in the week. It's a continuation of something I feel like I may be beaten to death, but uh, worthy of, of being beaten to death, I think. Um, Erica, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I was raised in Louisiana uh, as a racist. I'm emotionally wired as a racist. And those emotions are the first things that show up for me. Uh, last Sunday morning in a discussion group, somebody said, I'd really like to know how racists feel I wasn't sure they really wanted to know, but I decided I would go ahead and share that with them. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm also open to, uh, you know, somebody said that we're thinking, we're feeling animals that think. And so, uh, and I think that's why Fritz Perls commented, we need to lose our mind and come to our senses. And, uh, but if it's not a safe place to do that, it's very hard to do that when you know you're going to either be belittled, judged, even though it, you know, uh, it's a it's a tough thing to give people space to share because it uh, it challenges me uh, on a very deep level, and so I think people who are able to do that are sort of heroic. I'm I'm. Uh, anxious to hear what you guys have to say through the week. Thanks. Thanks, Dale. And um, I, I'm, I'm so pleased you'll be helping us move this conversation forward a little bit further on Thursday. I look forward to that. Um, Keith and Ellen. This is Keith uh, Helmuth. Uh, I'm, I'm here uh, with great gratitude because I've been absent from the summer seminar for a number of years since I'm not traveling a great deal anymore. Last year I had expected to be able to be on Cape Cod and then circumstances intervened and I wasn't able to make it. So this is a great pleasure to be with the group again and to see some new faces. 
I, I, I was walking back and forth here in my house after the presentation that Erica made because it really set me thinking. Uh, I've been sort of aware of this monument phenomena for a long time, but um, really, really struggling with it because because I'm a I'm a historian too, I guess of, of, of the sorts, and I really value things in, in history. But this, this whole situation really causes um, a lot of questions to come up, and I'll just mention one. It I, I had to think what's behind the whole monument phenomena. And there's an element of aggrandizement. And John Woolman has a lot to say about the dangers of aggrandizement. I won't go any further, but that's just a thought that I'd like to share because Quakers were very, very cautious and even opposed to the sense of aggrandizement that seems to afflict human beings. Thank you, thank you, Keith. Uh, Gray? Hi, I'm uh, Gray Cox. Um, I live in Bar Harbor, Maine. Um, I was one of the co-founders of QIF, so I've been with it for, from the beginning. Um, and I uh, teach at a college here. It's a school for human ecology called College of the Atlantic. And I've been interested for a very long time in peace studies and ways in which peace is obscured in our culture, ways in which we uh, we find that we define it in terms of what it's not, that it's not war, not conflict, instead of what it is. And that we, we have a culture in which we have a, a verb uh, for making war. We can talk about nations warring in the Middle East, but we can't talk about them peacing in Scandinavia, even though they've been doing that successfully for quite a while. And that I, I've been interested for a long time in how that those things about facts about our language reveal a lot about our culture, that it's systematically a culture of conflict rather than a culture of peace. So I've been interested in, in that. And more recently, I've been really interested in the ways in which that gets played out in technology. And um, especially with developments in artificial intelligence and the kinds of intelligence, the conception of what intelligence is, what it is to be smart or rational, and what might be alternatives that emphasize wisdom more than just rocket science intelligence and a kind of wiser earth that might be a goal for us all. And I'll be sharing uh, a project that uh, Judy Lum and Larry Jordan and I are all working on, on an uh, artificial intelligence circle of discernment. We'll be sharing work with that on this coming Friday. I've also been working um, on uh, trying to develop a shorter version of the summer research seminar, like an afternoon session. And along with um, Sarah uh, Walcott, who's one of our other uh, board members and uh, Ram Subramanian from India, we organized uh, such a session um, last uh, a, a week ago uh, as a um, kind of experiment. And the theme of it was on community based security. And we were trying to involve people from around the world. So there'll be a discussion session on that tonight at uh, 7 to 9 Eastern Daylight Time that I'll be leading. And I'm just really delighted to see everybody, all the new folks as well as ones who've been here for a while, and look very much forward to all the sharing this week. Thank Thanks. you very much. Uh, Gray, I, um, I think Ellen is on the side of the screen. Let me move back up to New Brunswick and let Ellen <laughs> okay. introduce herself. This was unexpected. <laughs> I just feel as though I've been on the sidelines listening with Keith. He had to switch to my computer quickly because his doesn't work anymore with the Zoom. He, he needs an upgrade and he can't do it on his old computer. So I think we have to think about getting him a new computer so he can continue to be um, on this um, uh, conversation. And um, I must say, Keith often talks about <clears throat> the gratitude and the pleasure he has felt with the founding of Quaker Institute for the Future. And um, I remember being in Gray's yard, I think it was back in 2003, when uh, we did a lot of organizing there um, uh, in that beautiful space. And uh, Leonard Joy was there and um, a number of people. 
So congratulations on the summer research seminar and I hope things continue to go well for you and um, blessings. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, John Howell. <clears throat> Hi, yes, uh, I'm in Athens, Ohio. Uh, uh, I'm a retired physiologist. Uh, uh, been in Quaker meetings in, in Michigan and Pennsylvania, Pens Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and Los Angeles, uh, and now in Athens, Ohio. Uh, when I retired uh, uh, from uh, doing physiology, I at the same time, I encountered uh, Greg Coleridge from the American Friends Service Committee, who introduced me to the whole notion of how our monetary system works. And I was quite surprised at all of this, shocked, as a matter of fact. And since that time, I've become very interested in that whole thing and will be uh, giving a presentation on Wednesday. Uh, I'm sort of struggling with how to do this in the spirit of worship. I will try. <laughs> and uh, I'm now on the, uh, the board of directors of the national organization called the Alliance for Just Money um, as, part of that, uh, as part of that effort. And my first experience with QIF was two years ago um, and was there with, uh, with Ed Dreeby uh, because Ed and I have worked along with John Lodenkamper, who is here also, um, with regard to uh, uh, bringing this issue to the Friends uh, Committee on National Legislation. And I was just inspired at the Ithaca meeting uh, of Cliff by all of you, and I'm grateful to uh, have, have the opportunity to be back amongst you again. Thank you. Thank you, John. So, so wonderful to have you with us. Uh, John Lodenkamper. Uh, yes, um, also very glad to be here and see the new faces and familiar faces. Uh, even though it's by Zoom and not in person. Um, I'm a member of Mountain View meeting in Denver, and I also serve on the QIF board and was a co-author of the latest focus book, uh, Toward a Life-Centered Economy, From the Rule of Money to the Rewards of Stewardship. And I'll be clerking the uh, late session on Wednesday, uh, the post-COVID future. Thank, thank you, John. And um, I, you know, I, I think we're priming the pump a little for that discussion. That was a bit intentional. And I think that's, uh, it's good to know that we're going to have these stopping points along the way to continue the rich discussion that's starting today. Uh, Judy? I'm Judy Lum. Um, I'm still a member of Atlanta Friends Meeting, although I've lived in Belize for 33 years. Um, I'm now living in Barranco Village in the south. It's a Griffina village. Um, Griffina is an indigenous group. This is not colonized land. I live among the Griffina people. Um, my role in QIF is um, a publications coordinator, so uh, I'm the one that puts the books together eventually, so I'm especially interested. In <laughs> and now that I'm the one talking, my Griffin a dinner is is arriving. I'll see if I can make her wait a minute. Um, I wanted to I wanted to say one of the things we have in 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 mind that um, has been brought up as a future book is 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 um, called Bridging Our Polarities. And uh, um, Frank Granshaw has suggested this and he had a similar, a similar story to what you said, Dale, that he has grown up in the midst of, of uh, uh, the, he said, he said, where I grew up, everybody thinks environmentalists are there, are there, uh, they're, they're, um, hmm enemies enemies yeah uh and he wanted to do something about that and help us do something about that so i'm hoping you also um can help us with this dale i really appreciate your saying that um erica thank you very much i think you have set the stage we are the quaker institute for the future and you've set the stage of where we are and our job is to figure out the future thank you 
Thank you, Judy. Uh, Larry and Caroline. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Larry Jordan and accompanied by my darling wife who will speak for herself in a moment. Uh, this will be my fourth uh, Institute for the Future. And uh, I was introduced by Laura Holliday who invited us to come. Uh, I'm a retired uh, jack of all trades. My last thing was in biomedical engineering, but I was educated as a physicist. And as a physicist, my mission in life is to try to figure out how the world works. And so uh, I see uh, our civilization as part of a global thing where we're involved in the environment of the earth and with uh, the issue that I'm sure uh, some others are going to take up. There's a present presentation going to be made on ecological economics, I think, by uh, someone. I don't have the program in front of me right now. But uh, each time that I have presented something that sort of tries to tie humans into the whole uh, scheme of what's going on, uh, on Earth has been what I've been trying to get at. Uh, and so we took a trip to the Gambia two years ago under the auspices of the then ambassador and learned a few things. And since then I've learned a few other things which stimulated me to offer the presentation I'm going to offer on tomorrow. And uh, I uh, hope that uh, it's interesting, but it's not going to be uh, an earth-shaking amount of new information. It's just some insights that uh, I've had since that original trip, and uh, I look forward to sharing that with you. I'm Caroline. I don't know if you can see me, I guess. Can you? I Thank you very much. Um, Larry and I have been on an exciting journey for, I should not tell you, 60 plus years, 60. So uh, the Gambia is one of the places we visited and also many other places in Africa and Europe. Uh, what I do, great, the greatest joy I have is being with him and sojourning on the things of the mind and the things of the spirit and the heart. And so this is our Quaker adventure and for him to be able to bring access to me by being this physicist and all of that, it gives us something different to talk about and exciting. I happen to be on uh, CUNO's board, Quaker United Nations Committee, and we both have been on the AFSC board. So we AFS, AFSC years, uh, 40, 50 years of serving in that way now it's important since we have three grandchildren who are birthright Quakers to make some sense out of the world for them. And one just recently said, who spoke by the way, David spoke with his grandfather, he's 27, and he spoke with his grandfather two quips ago on artificial intelligence. But he's becoming discouraged about things and with the world. He is in transition and in graduate school and master's program. So perhaps you'll see him again, but our challenge is to try to make some sense, if not of the world of what we've tried to do and make some predictions of what maybe we can do and then try to get about doing it. Thank you for having me be a sojourner with Larry. Well, it's great to be part of your journey, uh, really is. Um, Laura.
Lori, you need to unmic yourself so that we can hear you. Okay. Am, am I on mic? Yes. Okay. My name is Laura Holiday, and I am with Dell Bordelon down here in Texas. Um, and I invited Dale uh, to be a participant in uh, Cliff's thing, and I think he's been a real asset. Um, I'm a member of Lava Friends Meeting and South Central Yearly Meeting, and uh, it's so good to see faces from um, from uh, Falmouth and from um, where do we have it? Ithaca. Uh, the last time and um, and just new faces and old faces and it's really good to be back. Uh, we've been dealing with pandemics down here. I have a, a challenged son who is a um, kidney transplant uh, person and so I've really been trying to keep him out of the public and all of that and out of this virus business. So between uh, pandemics and hurricanes and all of that. We're still here. So it's good to, it's good to be with you. And Erica, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, uh, in some areas different from mine, but it was good to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Leonard, if you could un unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Yeah. You can hear me? Yes. Good. Yes, Leonard Joy. I'm a member of Strawberry Creek Meeting. I was a founder member of QIF. And uh, I'm still on the board. It's been a great pain for me for the last three years to be unable to be participant in the summer research sem seminar. And I have to be grateful to COVID for making it possible for the summer research seminar to include me. Um, I did not feel able to present something uh, as a, a written paper, but I would very much like to um, discuss some notes that I have sent with Jeff and I think is circulating. Uh, and anyone uh, who picks up um, resonates in any way with those notes. They're about my two real concerns, although mostly one of them, that is the economy and how we do move forward uh, to make it something we can all live with. And the other is um, our current projected path to dystopia. Uh, anyone's got thoughts about those things. I'd love to talk to you about it. I'd love to thank Erica very much for her presentation. In, in many ways it resonates or provides a, a, a weaving for me on the thinking of, of the path to dystopia because there is a path there of, of value shift to more me think uh, and uh, I found it very, very um, helpful to to reflect on. It is wonderful to see my friends and to see new friends. Thank you. Greetings to you all. <laughs> wonderful, Thank you. And Jeff. And... Thank you, Leonard. And um, yes, thanks for pointing out the the upside of Zoom. Uh, it has allowed some of you to to join us that might not otherwise have been yeah. able to. And I did indeed share um, Leonard's uh, draft paper as an, a new appendix, so you should have it in the program, and that's something i have um, anticipating we can talk more about in, in the Wednesday afternoon session. Uh, Margaret. Hey, I am from Ithaca, and I have been eating a muffin made for me by Jim Grant, who's going to be with us a little bit today. Um, and um, also, um, um, Angela Hopkins and I were going to do a presentation on uh, the connections between COVID, the climate crisis, and how those two crises are lenses into the ongoing crises 
of racism and ecological destruction for the benefit of the few. And uh, we ended up not doing it because we both did a lot of work for New York Yearly Meeting Sessions, and she was the plenary speaker. Um, I, for New York Yearly Meeting, I am co-clerk of their Earth Care Working Group and assistant clerk of a new working group, the Climate Justice Working Group. And um, I want to uh, mention that we were instrumental in getting Friends Fiduciary to divest from fossil fuels. And um, first we got New York Yearly Meeting to agree to do it gradually, one sixth per year. But before they even got to do the second transfer out of the funds with fossil fuels, Friends Fiduciary announced they're getting completely out. And one of the resources we used for educating people both within New York Yearly Meeting and at Friends Fiduciary is the Quiff book, Towards the Right Relationship with Finance. So thank you to all of you for that. Um, and I would, um, I, I want to express my appreciation to Erica because she lifted up those connections that Angela and I wanted to explore in some depth. And, um, in weaving this complex tapestry today. Um, she, she was pointing to the kinds of connections Angela and I had hoped to explore. Thank you, Margaret. And I, I'm sure there will be a time and uh, maybe in particular on the sessions on Wednesday, but not just that to, um, to share some more of your thinking. Uh, Phil and Elaine. Uh, yes, this is uh, Phil Emmy. Um, I'm here with my wife Elaine and our granddaughter Liliana. We are members of the uh, Bloomington, Indiana Friends Meeting and are presently and for the next several weeks in, um, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn on the East River looking across at the Manhattan skyline. Um, it's very fine and wonderful to see so many old and new faces. Uh, it's curious to me how well many of you uh, come across in your presence uh, on Zoom and also how I'm missing your, your corporal presence uh, in, in person. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing that we are able to gather this way and I'm so happy that we can. Um, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, as uh, the construction liaison for Bloomington Friends Meeting, we have uh, finally completed our rebuilding of our meeting house and uh, uh, just in time to enjoy it for a few months before we put it to rest uh, so that we all might be um, less exposed to this pernicious virus. <laughs> Uh, but that, that project is done and um, I'm very pleased and so are many very pleased with the way it's come out. Um, I am a retired professor of urban and regional planning. Um, I am quite familiar with all of the uh, five crises that Erica mentioned in her presentation. Uh, they have been with us for a very long time. It's uh, interesting to me to see how many of these um, issues uh, come to our attention so rapidly and how rapidly change is possible um, when it is ripe for happening. Um, I, I guess I'm particularly taken up with the, the way in which phase changes happen in so many different um, realms of our, our life. Um, this seems also to be happening with respect to our awareness about climate change, a topic on which I have been interested for a long time. And uh, so I resonated particularly with Gray's uh, comments about how we are actually able to get things done very rapidly when, when the occasion arises. So um, I'm particularly hopeful too uh, on that regard, but uh, at the same time I have a, a guarded uh, sense of pessimism with respect to the way in which um, earth systems can change precipitously in their functioning and the implications that that has for our collective well-being. 
again, it's just wonderful to be with you all. And um, I, I wish you all uh, good health uh, and, uh, and, and security with respect to the issues we're all facing. And um, please carry on with the spirit that I'm all so familiar. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. And I guess we'll, uh, we might see Elaine and, and Liliana later, but we'll move along here. Rod, uh, Rod Werner. <clears throat> Rod, you'll have to unmute yourself and then you can share, introduce yourself. Sorry. Hi, I'm here in West Falmouth, like the three other participants from our meeting. Uh, my long-term membership is in Monadnock in New Hampshire. Um, I'd just like to note that I'll be missing, as today, a couple of other days at noon because this is running right up against our sessions. And Sheree Spock is furthering our understanding of eco-reformation as friends uh, are trending. And um, I want to attend that at least two more times. But I'm very glad to be here and uh, it's good to see some of the faces I met last year when you were here. W one other note, I shared the link for tomorrow's regenerative agriculture with two Quaker farmers. Is that okay? Yeah, that that's fine. Um, we have space for up to 100 people and um, we're not really pushing that. So uh, that's fine, Rod. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, they're very busy, of course, this time of year, but I hope we hear from Tuckaway and Sun Moon Farm tomorrow. Thank you, Rod. And uh, Susan Cousins. Um, hi, I'm from Eastside Friends Meeting, which is on the east side of the Seattle, uh, Washington area. I'm a relatively new Northwesterner, um, having moved uh, a little over two years ago from Atlanta, where I've actually met uh, Judy in person um, and we often show up on zoom together on sunday mornings in atlanta still from different time zones so i joined the retired professor uh, group here i was a um, professor of public policy at the georgia institute of technology in atlanta and my research area is actually um, the um, kind of connections between science technology and innovation policies and global inequalities so I've been reading QIF uh, books recently and realized that this is an intellectual community that I'm really um, hungry for and I'm looking forward to interacting with you. I want to point out that Caroline and I have both have worked together through AFSD and I actually heard about QIF for the first time from uh, Larry when, when he was tagging along with her a few years ago at an AFSD. Uh, gathering. So I'm looking forward. I'll be kind of in and out all week, but I very much value the opportunity to join you. Well, thank you for joining us, uh, Susan. And thanks to all of you uh, for the introduction. That was time well spent, I think, in terms of us all getting to know each other and, and building uh, a relationship. It, it did uh, cut a, a little into the additional time we had to talk about uh, Erica's presentation. Um, I'd ask that if you're able to, that, that we continue with about 15 minutes more uh, of silent worship. Um, and Erica, maybe you wanna um, just hear what people say and, and, and then take some time at the end after anyone else who's shared um, to, to, to comment on anything that comes up. Um, and as we do that, just uh, one, one more remember, reminder that we're, that we're doing this um, out of worship and um, please try to give a little bit of time after uh, each intervention um, before before you speak in. Uh, uh, yeah, so let's enter silence for about another more uh, 15 more minutes.
I wonder if I might, uh, Carlos Duarte, um, just in terms of Erica's presentation, which I very much appreciated, and I've known Erica for a long time now, and we've worked together as friends and colleagues. Um, I found the whole of it, the presentation, all of that, the visuals and the information, and the, like a thread. But the thread that stands out for me, to which I've given a great deal of thought in this for years, it seems, but in these last months. Um, is the thread in, of the United States history of violence and her start with the wars and so on. Um, and I find that in part because I live abroad. Uh, I keep up, I go to the United States probably an average of once a year for almost 30 years, sometimes more because of my work. And I'm a Catholic sister. So I, go to the US, I'm officially part of our US Canada province, go for gatherings and so on. Uh, we do now use, uh, as all of us, using Zoom. Um, so I, I, it's, it's very striking to be born and from a uh, culture, but my father was Mexican, so I had some sense of being other as well, but grew up in the US. But one of my observations that I think Erica's presentation uh, illustrated in a variety of ways is this history of violence in the United States with uh, the individualism and uh, materialism. And even though now, I don't know the current wars, I don't keep track of the specific wars, but we can add to those wars trade, what they call trade wars, you know, the capitalist wars. But something I've noticed I first noticed it when I was up in, I think I was in Boston, I was reading the Boston Globe, I think, and I recognized that the people in the United States were no longer referred to as citizens or residents, they were referred to as consumers. So that's, that was one observation. And then the other that I've noted is the use of language in everyday parlance uh, of violent words, fight, we're going to fight for the environment. We're going to fight for peace. Now, I, my personal history is many, many years ago, I, I was in my late 20s, I uh, decided to become a vegetarian uh, in part, major part of it, because I wanted to be more of a pacifist and not favor killing anything. And, uh, and I could do to still be working at my pacifism, but I've become very sensitive as a result to language. And I'm also a visual artist, so I'm aware of language and art and, and art in various forms. And this use of various words like fight, like weapons, uh, weaponized. It, once you become sensitive, you see it every place. And I would say maybe a year or two ago, I read an article, I read a lot online of you know, literary journals, the New York Review of Books, the London, whatever. And I read a review of, um, it was an article about a presentation about uh, a prize for women's um, writing. And the presenter, I don't remember the names, but the presenter spoke of the award-winning book or the book to be recognized as a weapon. She was favorable about the book and the book she defined as a weapon. And it was so horrifying to me to see the um, invasion of violent vocabulary um, into intellectual and other endeavors. And I think for me, so much of what I've heard this morning and noted in Erica's presentation is the culture of violence, which is prevalent still and has its own current forms right through the uprisings and so on of, of um, the recent months of that culture of violence and the attentiveness that's required on the part of us, all of us, in terms of the language we use. And we can say, well, you know, fight, it's just an ordinary word now. And the way love is, you know, I love, you know, I love tamales, uh, you know, uh, we, but I think it's something else. There's something when a word is constant, a word, associated words are used that are violent. It affects the way we think of ourselves and we think of our culture, we think of other people. So 
So I just, there was something I noted, I really resonated from the very beginning with Erica's presentation and that, uh, the, the manifestations that have come that she illustrated as well for that. And I, I appreciate very much that. And I think too, I'm waiting still to see when there will be serious challenge to the United States military budget. We talk about monies for helping, you know, trying to find the money to give relief, trying to find the money for the COVID, uh, whatever it is. And there's this giant military, gigantic military budget in the United States for the US imperial intentions, apart from that capitalist um, trade war type. But, but military for literal wars and violence. And I, I think that would be a tremendous sign of something if, if that could be raised as a question by ordinary citizens, assisted by others, of course, who are the thinkers. Most of you are, it appears, a good piece of you in this gathering. But th these are concerns of mine. And I was just very grateful to be, see some of that reflected in Erica, but also in the various comments that have followed. And so I, I just wanted to underline that. Just read the paper and see the number of times a violent word is used to describe something positive. It, it's really, it's rather disheartening. But it also means that uh, once we are, we are alert, we can change, in, both in ourselves and, and pointing out or assisting others to see certain signs of things that are ultimately quite damaging. Uh, to the way we think and feel and relate to others. Um, so in any case, I'm, I'm grateful to have this chance just to say a few words and to be with you all during these, these days. Thank you. Um, early in her presentation, something that stuck out for me, resonated with me, was when Erica said that all sculpture is myth-making, referring in particular to public sculpture. And then she gave us lots of examples of that. But through the arc of her presentation, she really turned that on its head head um, by showing us the way people are using public art, um, changing it, tearing it down, beheading it, projecting different images onto it um, as a way for promoting wider changes. I mean, just the opposite of the intention of um, art that's sanctioned as myth-making as part of preserving the status quo of those who are entitled. I mean, like that controversial statue of uh, Lincoln with the enslaved people who'd been emancipated um, was apparently paid for by formerly enslaved people, but the design wasn't chosen by them, is, is what I understand. Um, so this spontaneous reinterpreting of public monuments seems really important. And, and I liked the way that fit in with her choice of quotes. Um, but I also just want to put a PS on the John Lewis quote, the one, I mean, it's what everybody's been saying over and over, his good trouble. Um, but just noting as the people here really know, there's this new style where you use one word and then you say nothing else. My one word is hegemony. Um, there are things besides statues that need dismantling and um, good trouble. Um, 
is going to be a really important part of that. But as Carlotta was saying, and Gray, on peaceful terms, not on their terms. This is Dale, and uh, uh, what Carlotta referred to uh, has been brought to my attention over the last, I guess, six or seven years. Um, a quote by Buck Minister Fuller, who said, if you want to change the system, don't fight the existing one, create a paradigm that makes the existing system obsolete. And that kind of resonated with me because I had heard somebody tell me many years ago, what we resist persists, that we actually give energy to things we fight against. And uh, I'm just glad to hear somebody else uh, comment on that in particular, it takes a lot more creativity to create a paradigm that makes the existing one obsolete. And in my impatience, I'm willing to throw rocks at the existing one just to get my feelings out. <laughs> so I can kind of relate to the violence and all the other stuff. I just know that it, and I know in my heart of heart, I'm not really helping. At that point, I'm just uh, uh, becoming a part of the problem rather than a solution. Jeff, this is Laura. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Laura. Okay. Erica? I would just like to encourage you, if you can, to include in your presentation the two Americas that we live in. One is white America and one is black America. And what happened to George Floyd, which is, is from my hometown, every time we send our kids out, this is a possibility. And it's terrifying, it's stressful. You cannot believe how stressful it is. And so if you could just um, include in your paper this particular thing, I think it would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you for so much for saying that. Um, I thought my best approach would be to take a very personal point of view and being a white person, <laughs> especially in this moment of time, I think it's um, inadvisable and uh, without enough veracity or believability for me to speak on behalf of, of African American people. So it ideal would be for somebody else to make another presentation from that point of view. And I wish it had been you, because I think I met you at West Falmouth last year, didn't I? Hello? Laura, yes. there, yeah. And I wanted to share with Carlotta, the um, FCNL has been addressing the military budget for years and still doing it, Carlotta. So if you wanna get more information on that, they. Every year they address it. Yes, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that reference. And uh, I, I join all of you and them when we will start seeing this attention to this in the wider press media, that this, is, this effort is happening. Thank you. Well, friends, um, we have had a 
this incredibly rich uh, opening session here. Um, I don't think this conversation conversation that Erica has opened up is anywhere near concluded. And luckily we have um, a week and many more sessions in which to bring this conversation back up as it relates to uh, things that we'll be hearing. I think that starts with the, the late afternoon uh, session that Gray will be leading um, on communities of security. Um, and of course, this is something that anybody, if they would like, could create a breakout room around. Um, uh, as I said earlier, this is also a theme that I thought in particular would come back up um, fairly directly in the discussion on Wednesday, uh, but not exclusively just um, uh, on Wednesday. So if you've had continuing thoughts, please hold them. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and there will be other opportunities to share, uh, to share them. Uh, Erica, I just will give you one last chance if you want to have anything that you want to say to close out uh, this session, um, after which we will uh, reconvene in a different Zoom address. Please take note of that, a different Zoom address for the breakout rooms. Um, and then a different Zoom address again. And that was only for tonight because of a scheduling conflict that I will send out later. Um, so we will reconvene at those times at 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Pacific, uh, Eastern uh, for the breakout rooms and tonight uh, at four o'clock uh, Pacific and seven o'clock uh, Eastern for the session on uh, communities of security. Um, Erica. Oh, the only thing I can say is, again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to think through uh, all of the things I, I discussed uh, that we've been living, I've been living uh, for the last couple of months, and for the wonderful response that makes me think of many, many things. And again, I would like to invite Laura to do a presentation uh, next to mine. And if she can't do it in this uh, context to uh, put it online because my presentation was 32 megabytes. <laughs> and so I'm willing to email, I'm not mail, mail, uh, snail mail to you if you give me your address, Greg, uh, Jeff, excuse me. Um, I, I will give you a, um, what do you call it, flash drive with the 32 megabyte things and then you can figure out how to post it. Does that make sense or does that make sense? Oh, that's fine. Erica, we happy to have a, a conversation on the side on how we can. All right. So in Thank any you. case, if you can post mine, then maybe Laura can do one and you can post it next to it because I, I can't give that point of view. That's it. Thank you so much. Be well. Thank you, Erica. Thanks to everyone. See you again um, in a little over an hour. <laughs>